Hello and welcome to another edition of Legislative Update. My name is Tom Ayers, Senior Staff Writer for the Vermont Standard Newspaper in Woodstock. And this is our weekly, during the legislative session, get together with Representative Tesha Buss of Woodstock. Uh, and we're, uh, we're talking about uh, today about the remaining couple of weeks of this year's legislative session and what some of the hot button and top agenda items are for the Senate in the House uh, as the legislative session winds down. Hi, Tasha, good to see you. Thanks, Tom. Good to uh, have you be here. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'd like to start first with, um, with an issue that has been um, uh, prominent in the legislature the last couple of sessions, indeed for quite some time now, uh, and that is the formation of a statewide rental registry of both long-term and short-term um, rental units in this state. Uh, it seems that the, uh, the House has uh, opted to um, move away from passing that legislation this year and instead uh, is forming a, a joint Senate and House study commission to look at the issue uh, for potential action in a coming legislative session. I wonder if you can talk a little bit about how that action unfolded in this legislative session and why the rental registry, which was vetoed by Governor Scott at the end of the last session, why that's uh, remaining on hold and instead going the study commission route. Yes, absolutely. So it's going to the study commission it's going to the study commission so that we can determine how best to finance it. Um, what wasn't clear was if the fees that were put forth in the bill, which was $35 per unit, would actually cover the cost of maintaining a statewide registry. And it's also um, the Agency of Digital Services has two different ways that they hold information where how they store it. One is cloud-based and one is more, um, you know, brick and mortar based, if you will. And so one is, you know, if we hold it ourselves and not put it in the cloud, it's exceptionally more expensive. So I think they really want to take a deeper dive into our hard-earned taxpayer dollars um, of state government to make sure that we do host this in the, in the most efficient way possible. Because if it is gonna cost more money, then they have to decide, will they put that charge on all long-term and short-term rentals alike, or will they have short-term rentals be more in alignment with, let's say, how lodging establishments pay the Board of Health? You know, we, um, I, I own a business and I pay a Board of Health license and they come in and they inspect my lodging establishment. I'm also, you know, um, under the jurisdiction of fire the Department of Fire Safety. Sure. And so part of the bill creates some of those extra um, members of fire safety as well to inspect all of the rental properties, particularly the short-term rentals have never been inspected. A lot of them have not been inspected before unless the local municipality requires it. So um, yeah, so hopefully they're sending it back to the drawing board to make sure that we get it right. Good, good. Okay, thanks. That that clarifies that. And, and I presume that commission will be uh, named as, as part of this legislative session and then do its work in the coming months ahead. Is that accurate? That's right. And so it'll come back to us next session. Excellent. In January. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, another another uh, issue that I know is very uh, close to your heart and mind, and that is um, child care legislation. And specifically, uh, this legislative session, uh, S-56. Um, where does that legislation stand post crossover and, uh, uh, and what are some of its central tenets? Yeah, so uh, this is a bill that started in the Senate and moved to the House and the Senate had the solution to public pre-K potentially be a, a study committee of bringing four-year-olds into the public sector, making every public school system in Vermont post a Public, pre, publicly funded pre-K for just four-year-olds. Mm -hmm. Now, what the House is looking at is continuing more of a, what they call mixed delivery system, private providers and the public school system, and not mandating that it only happen in the public school system, and also not mandating that it only happen for four-year-olds in the public school system. Um, there is a, a lot of debate over how they would fund that? Are we going to keep it at 10 hours a week? 
will we increase it to 20 hours a week? Right now, um, a, a pre-K pre pupil is worth, it, it costs half as much or you're paid half as much um, to the pub, from voters to the public school system for a, a pre-K student as you are a kindergarten student. Some, mm -hmm. a lot of the school systems say that's not enough. So they might actually raise that weight to one. Um, it's important that the public pre-K option is really, really beneficial for kids that have learning disabilities um, that, you, that are already known or for them to be discovered. So special mm -hmm. education services in pre-K is considerably easier to administer sometimes in a pre-K setting that's in the public school system where the folks that are administering other special education are, they're already hosted there. So that's a huge part of it. But one thing that is pretty consistent across the board is raising the, the CCFAP, the Child Care Financial Assistance Program. Right now, the income level is set so low that people are not receiving meaningful subsidies for their child care. So that level will be increased so that more families, even in the middle income, will be able to have a subsidy for their uh, for their children. Okay, okay. It, it, it seems like that aspect of the legislation, the subsidies, um, uh, is likely to move successfully through the legislature this year. Uh, on the pre-K, uh, public pre-K issue, um, uh, is it possible that that could be pulled out of the final legislation and deferred for another year in a study group as well? Uh, is that on the table for discussion? That is on the table for discussion. I intuit that we will not move swiftly in that direction. It does affect a lot of school systems that are already challenged in the pandemic anyway. So mm -hmm. to make those adjustments, you know, it's, the height of sinks and their special toilets for, um, you know, for pre-K oh, students. Sure. So there's a lot of infrastructure that would need to change um, to make that kind of offering. So my intuition is that we will not move forward mandating that every public school will do that this year. I could be wrong, um, but that mm -hmm. would be my intuition from where we, where discussions are currently. Okay. Great, great. And, and one other question in this regard, um, and we've talked about this in the past as well. Um, there's been some, um, there's been some talk from the child care community. I've heard this from uh, you as well, that the, um, the qualifications, the regulation that we place upon um, uh, early childhood educators here in Vermont um, is significantly uh, more stringent than, for example, in neighboring New Hampshire. And I'm wondering if there's any discussion at the state legislature or at the regulatory level um, with regard to, to you know, loosening those um, requirements a little bit so that we broaden our, um, uh, broaden our base of potential applicants for those kinds of positions. Yes, thank you for bringing this back to the table. It's not technically in these bills from the Senate or in the House, mm -hmm. but it has been brought up that the study for child care that the legislature put forth last year stated that being public pre-K money, whether in the private or public sector, being administered by both the Child Development Division and the Agency of Education meant that there was conflicting leadership. And so both of these bills require there to be a new position within the agency of education that is only specific to childcare. So it will be a new deputy secretary. Mm -hmm. What I hope is that they will then help to create these regulatory things. Like for instance, you know, as the education committee, we thought we had the ability to state whether or not we were going to um, relax teacher qualifications for K through 12. And we mm -hmm. found out that, that we actually don't. Um, and so I think it's going to be the same in the childcare sector where, where that is not actually legislated. That's done through the deputy secretary and then underneath um, that particular person. I see. I can, that's kind of what I anticipated. It's, uh, it's out of your hands to a certain degree, but um, um, 
Moving on to a different topic, uh, a wholly different topic. What's the status of uh, paid family leave legislation, which has been a top priority of the Democratic leadership? Um, I know for the last uh, term or two, uh, where does that stand this time around? So the House passed a paid family medical leave that I would consider the, the Cadillac of all of the options that are out there. It would create a statewide insurance system to cover all employees. The reason why I very much support it is because it helps the sole proprietor uh, more than any other um, policy that's out there. Right now, if you have your own landscape gardening business and you're not on a payroll, you're not covered by unemployment insurance. And unless you have a specific disability policy, which is considerably more expensive than what this insurance policy would be, um, you'd be out to dry if you got hurt. And then if you get hurt, then you're really on the backs of taxpayers. Um, and then it's a, a really intense financial emergency. So the, the, the Senate is leaning towards something that is a bit more, you know, um, not mandated to everyone. And it, it but it, yet it isn't, um, the cost of the actual insurance does not vary too much from what the house is putting out. Mm -hmm. So it is still within the, um, it's within ways and means um, they actually put the paid family medical leave in the child care bill. The Senate did when it came over to the House. Wow. So, um, yeah, I thought that was very interesting. So um, mm. we it, 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 it's above my pay grade to answer um, yeah, how that yeah. will shake out because I sit in education. But um, I'm sure by next week I will have a, a, a stronger update for you. Sure, sure. So those two pieces of, of legislation have been merged now wow. they were merged they were merged by the senate okay whether the house will go along with that or not remains to be seen yeah. yes it feels like one could derail the other um to some degree i know i don't want to ask you to speculate on that but it just feels i don't know uh i think that was political positioning uh -huh. <laughs> imagine that eh <laughs> i know um Okay, uh, I'd like to, to uh, take a, a, a complete turn now and, and move on to a, a different topic outside of childcare and paid family leave, and that is um, ranked choice voting uh, in state, federal, state, and local elections, potentially in Vermont. Um, ranked choice voting for uh, those who may not be familiar with it basically enables you to rank an issue or candidates in your order of preference in the ballot box. And then there's a, um, a system by which those ranked choices ultimately result in a winner for the race, who may not be the person who got the plurality of the votes in the first round. Um, this has been uh, implemented and then withdrawn in Burlington over recent years. Uh, and now there's discussion at the state level about bringing it to Vermont for federal, state, and local elections. Uh, what's going on with ranked choice voting? Yes. So um, it's in the House Government Operations Committee. And I just um, looked this up to make sure that I got this right, because when it's not in your committee, you don't own the information the same way. So um, okay. this will allow for towns, cities, and villages to opt into ranked choice voting for a local election of a candidate running for an office in a town, but this doesn't apply to school board elections and towns can choose to rank choice vote starting in November of 2024. It also sets up a study committee, we love a study committee, um, to identify and examine issues that might arise in the future. Um, and then it would mandate that the statewide, statewide that we would use ranked choice voting for a U.S. presidential primary election for each major political party in 2028. Okay. So that's what's on the table right now. What about state elections, governor, uh, lieutenant governor? Is that part of the legislation as well or not? Not yet. So not yet. Yeah. Not yet. So says my, uh, yeah. the, the clip notes that I got from government ops. <laughs> and the opt-in feature, um, 
I can speak from from um, uh, personal experience, having been um, involved in city government in Burlington when um, when ranked choice voting um, uh, departed at the voters. Um, what that really means is it used to be that to go to ranked choice voting at the municipal level, you had to get a charter change approved by the state legislature. And, right. and this legislation would take the charter change piece out of it. It would not mandate ranked choice voting. It would just make it an easier process for uh, municipalities to move towards if they so choose. Um, and so uh, that, that's an interesting little twist there. Um, yeah. Uh, moving on to and, and sort of bringing us full circle here, I wanted to conclude with a discussion of a housing issue again. We started talking about the rental registry, and, and now I'd like to conclude with an update on where things stand with S100, which is legislation that looks to um, ease a path towards construction of, uh, of housing in village and town centers in a larger numbers than is currently allowed, particularly under Act 250. Um, I wonder if you can uh, update uh, our viewers on, on where S100 uh, stands at this point. Yes, so right now S100 passed out of the House Committee and it is over in Environment and Energy. And what was frustrating to the housing committee was that they did not get much input. They don't get to have much input into how Act 250 plays into the siting of housing. And that uh, the Speaker of the House was very clear that she felt that that should stick with environment and energy. And housing is frustrated because they feel that they deserve to have a say. Everyone pretty much agrees that it should be in downtown centers and um, villages and designation areas. Mm -hmm. But Act 250 has some strong rules that are very, it's a very expensive process. And most importantly, it's pretty duplicative. You know, when you have a downtown area, a large part of your criteria is already covered. You're on town sewer, you're on town water. You definitely know that you're not on an archeological site. You know if you're um, on the basis of historic preservation where you are. You don't have endangered species of plants, birds, animals. You're not in a brownfield. You're not in a wetland area. There are just so many criteria that are already checked off. So to mandate that every housing development, even if they're, you know, four units, um, go through that process, it's very expensive and it's based on the amount of construction cost. So for instance, when, when we did Rainbow Play School, a brand new Act 250, we just had to amend ours, but a brand new permit would have been $53,000. So to me, I, I believe that, um, that we are not only costing Vermont in that um, though we will need to subsidize housing even more by putting uh, folk developers through Act 250, um, but, but we will also be hurting those developers because there's something called a 1055 rule. And in our little town of Woodstock, this is particularly important. Developers are never gonna get, you know, you know 20 to 30 unit housing, or I shouldn't say never, it's unlikely that we will have a 20 or 30 unit development because it doesn't fit the character of our area. Mm -hmm. But a developer that comes in and does, you know, two, uh, you know, a four unit and a five unit, they're done for five years. They wouldn't be able to develop anything else in the town of Woodstock unless they got an Act 250 permit. Mm -hmm. So what they really wanted to do in the, in the housing committee was expand that to 24, not so that there would be 24 units in a building, but that 24 units could be built over the course of five years um, in, in many spots without triggering Act 250. It. So it's really important for everyone to understand how those numbers play out and how they're mm -hmm. cited. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. You, you've eliminated the issues um, uh, very well and appreciate it. Thanks so much. Uh, well, you've got your work cut out for you for the next couple of weeks, you and your fellow <laughs> legislators. Uh, and yeah. when, when, the, when the session's over, we'll have to have one final legislative update where you 
reflect back on your uh, on your first year as a legislator <laughs> see, how, <laughs> see how that uh, see how that plays out but um, as always it's been a pleasure speaking with you Tasha and look forward to seeing you uh, next week with some continued update as the uh, issues we've discussed today uh, move through these final weeks in the Senate and House. Uh, thanks so much and uh, all the best.